they claim that our eyes were just to get us slightly different from what they are. We be talking to see things of our Welcome to Strange Familiars. Allison's here. I am. This is our special Thanksgiving edition. It is. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Gratitude. I've got some gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to... Uh... <laughs> you completely threw me off. <laughs> you can't believe it? What I said to you? I can't believe what you said to me. I do have some gratitude. Bet you all didn't think we were going to do a show this week because of Thanksgiving. But here we are. Showing up. I'd bring mashed potatoes if it was socially acceptable. Personally, I don't really feel like there's an event that bringing mashed potatoes doesn't make better. I would agree. Well, hope everybody's doing well out there. Families are wonderful, but so are breaks from families. Yeah. So hey, have a little break. Have a little break. Listen to some spooky stories. Hang out with us for an hour. That's all you'd want to do in person anyway. That would be enough. And we've got a grab bag show tonight anyway. So lots of different stories. Before we get started with that, though, I want to thank our patrons. Thank you, patrons. Thank you so much. We could not do Strange Familiars without you. If you like what we do, if you like Strange Familiars, and you'd like to get extra Strange Familiars, along with your regular Strange Familiars. A double helping. You can become a patron at Patreon. Patreon.com slash Strange Familiars. All of our patrons get extra episodes of Strange Familiars every month, exclusive to our patrons. We do two every month. Sometimes we do more. We did three in October. You never know how crazy we're going to get, how many episodes we're going to drop. We give other content here and there to them, too. If I do songs for the podcast, sometimes I'll give them as free downloads to patrons and so forth. So if you want to help us out and get those extra shows, and also patrons get weekly shows without commercials. So if you want commercial-free weekly shows, you want the extra shows patrons get every month, go to Patreon, patreon.com slash strangefamiliars and become our patron. All right, you want to start us off with a newspaper story, Allison? I was going to start us off with a question about what your favorite pie is for thanks at Thanksgiving time. For Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So Are you apple or pumpkin? Rhubarb's out of it because rhubarb's not in season for mm -hmm. Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. right? So my favorite pie is rhubarb. But my favorite Thanksgiving pie? Mm -hmm. I'll have to go apple. you have to go apple. Not that there's anything wrong with pumpkin pie. Yeah. And uh, if apples didn't exist in the world, pumpkin would certainly be an acceptable yeah. substitute. Yeah, there's nothing wrong. Pumpkin pie is very close second. I'm not sad. Usually what I do is... When, you get a smaller piece of each. <laughs> yeah, and get, get a sliver of each to make like one whole piece. Mm -hmm. Or like one and a half pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I hate Thanksgiving, why not? Can you tell I'm obsessed with food right now and I just want it to be Thanksgiving? All right, Allison. All right. Let's get to the weird. You starting us off with a newspaper article? Yeah, this one is actually called Two Weird Stories. I don't know if we're reading both of the stories, but... When's it from? What newspaper? It is from our own York Dispatch in York, Pennsylvania, from the 19th of March in 1889. Quite a while ago. Yes. All right. Give us the two weird stories. Okay. People in Pennsylvania said to believe in witches. Unfortunately, there are quote-unquote doctors who have power of the evil creatures, a child under the spell, 
killing a bad man at long range. The belief of past ages in witchcraft is still entertained by many people in this, Berks County. Hearing of several men in the city who were said to be able to give well-authenticated cases of witchcraft, or hexing as it was called here, your correspondent visited one of them and was told the following story. Several years ago, a family with whom I was well acquainted lived on Cedar Street in this city, and directly opposite them on the same street lived a woman who was known to be a hex, the Dutch for witch. There was a child born in the family of my friend. It was a beautiful child, had the sweetest disposition of any youngster I ever knew, and never cried or gave its mother any trouble at all. And when the child was about three months old, the old hex came into my friend's house and, taking it out of the cradle, hugged and kissed it, and at the same time muttering the language in which the Bible was first written. When she left, it was at once noticed that the child was as completely spotted as a leopard, and it cried continually as though suffering great pain. It would cry at night as long as the hex across the street remained at the window, but as soon as the witch would retire, its cries would cease and it would get some rest. The state of affairs kept up for some time, and the regular doctors could do nothing for the child. Everybody knew the poor little thing was behexed, and the mother, worried nearly to death through anxiety and loss of sleep while attending the little sufferer, would not be satisfied until they sent for a witch doctor. The identical doctor still lives in the city. He came in an answer to their call but previous to his arrival had sent them a note warning them not to speak a word to him. He wrote several words in the Ethiopian language on a piece of paper, placed it in a certain place in the Bible, and after putting the book under the child's pillow, informed the mother that if they would refuse the hex across the way, everything she asked for, her baby would get well. The same day the old hex sent over for some trifles. I think it was for a smoothing iron or a pinch of tea, but the mother refused to let her have them, and from that moment the child commenced to get better. The third night after the witch doctor had been there, a big black cat came to the bedroom window and scratched to get in. The child's father, knowing that the old hex had sent the cat, picked up his boot and hurled it through the window, sash and all, struck the thing and knocked it to the ground. The fact is, when the boot struck the cat, it struck the witch herself, for she had turned herself into a cat in order to get into the room of the child. The next morning, the hex came limping around and said she had fallen downstairs the night before, but she never bothered my friend's child anymore, and everybody knew well enough that the words the doctor had put in the Bible were too strong for the devil in the hex. This, my dear, is a fact, and the child who has bewitched is now a man and has children of his own, and works on the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad. Your correspondent felt a very perceptible chill course its way up his backbone after listening to this recital, and the old gentleman noticing that something was wrong continued, you probably don't believe in witches. But I know there are witches in this city today who can do just as they please with you or me. When they sign a contract with the devil, with a pen dipped in their own blood, he gives them the power. I know a man living in the neighborhood of Boyertown in this county who was bewitched by a man living on 10th Street in the city 10 miles away from him. And what do you think of that? The witch would come to his house in the dead hour of the night, sometimes on a horse, and at other times in a big stone wagon, and no one could see him but the man he was torturing. The man's daughter could see the window fly up when the witch came into the room, and could see and hear the window fall when he went out, but could not see the witch himself. He would sit on the poor man's breast and hammer and pinch him dreadfully, and would keep it up nearly every night until he had so him so sore that he could scarcely move at all. He came to Reading one day and consulted the witch doctor, who wrote some words on a slip of paper, folded it up, and giving the man a horseshoe nail, told him to go to a certain tree early in the morning, before sunrise, and stick this nail through the paper and drive it into the side of the tree next to the sun, just far enough to hold the paper to the tree. This, he said, would hurt the witch and probably keep him away. If the witch would not stay away, he was to hit the nail another tap the next morning, but was warned not to drive the nail clear through the paper, or he would kill the man who was the witch. The witch continued to trouble the man, however, and when he went out to tap the nail the third morning, he was so angry that taking the axe in his hand, he struck the nail so hard that he sent it entirely through the paper, and upon the instant the nail penetrated the paper, he saw the form of his tormentor fall dead before him, and he went to the depot and told several parties that he had killed such and such a man in Reading that morning. They laughed at him and said he was crazy, but sure enough the witch, who was walking in the garden in this city, ten miles away, as the doctor said he would do and as the man said he had done, fell dead in his tracks just at that time. The man who killed him got well and was never troubled again. The names of the parties were given in both the above cases, and the old man told his story with such an air of sincerity that after leaving him I made inquiry in the localities he had mentioned and found the opinion generally prevalent that such things had occurred. 
More especially was this the case in reference to the man who was said to have dropped dead in the garden, and there are not a few in the city who would swear that it is true substantially as herein given. Witch and ghost stories implicitly believed by those who narrate them can be gathered by the dozen in this county. They are told by the muscular farmer lover to his buxom country sweetheart, are related to the children in euphonious Pennsylvania but Dutch by their parents, and are subject of many long arguments and conversations in the country stores. I think I had a magazine in my ill-begotten youth called Buxom Country Sweetheart. <laughs> Was it just girls eating shoe fly pie? <laughs> I'm back on the pie, apparently. I know, right? <laughs> the witch bending over and holding the kid and then the kid coming up with like spots all over it. Yeah, what kind of spots? I, I wouldn't think witchcraft. I'd think plague, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm like, like oh, cool. The neighbor gave him smallpox. Yeah, what would you do to my kid? <laughs> Those stories are pretty common, though, like how to find witches kind of stories, like doing the different things like that. There's a lot of charms and long lost friends stuff, like how to find a witch. I also thought it was interesting. It was the first time I ever saw anyone make reference to um, uh, an Aramaic or Ethiopian languages. Yeah. yeah, I've never read that in anything related yeah, to I wonder like if they Pennsylvania kn- Dutch. If they knew the Bible was, the, like the original language of the Bible was Aramaic, or if they were thinking Latin, maybe, mm-hmm. or Greek, you know. Or Ethiopian. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right, we have uh, listener-submitted stories as well. This is from Mike A. My girlfriend had a couple days off work recently and wanted to go camping, so I suggested Michelle, seeing as it's about three-ish hours away from us in Pittsburgh and that I'd heard so much about it from your podcast. I reserved a campsite online. The first one I clicked on was called Haunted Hollow. I've hiked through Haunted Hollow. And I figured I can't pass this up. We arrived late afternoon and set up camp, remarking on how it felt powerful but not creepy. Long story short, that night I saw what appeared to be a satellite come across the sky from north to south and proceed to make weird zigzag motions before I lost sight of it. I didn't notice anything else that night. The next morning, my girlfriend told me she had seen gold-colored lights in the woods, somewhere around five feet off the ground, maybe 15 to 20 feet away from us in the trees, but got a strong urge not to mention it at the time she saw them. She's not a listener to any podcasts on the subject and had only heard me mention mystery lights briefly with no detail. I'm possibly missing a few details here and there, but I hope this is interesting info for you regardless. Why, yes, it is spent some time in Haunted Hollow. Might have to spend some more time there. I mean, the name. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a reason why it's called that, right? I'm sure. They don't call it, like, Sugar Sweet Land. Exactly. You want to do another listener story? You want to do another article yeah, next? Maybe go back and forth. All right, let's do another article. Back Into the past. I know I've said before, and I don't know if anybody else will remember this, because I've looked this up recently. There was a series of, I think they were TV shows that lasted from, I think they started off as radio shows and became TV shows from the 50s, 60s, and 70s called You Were There. You Were There. Mm -hmm. Do you remember those at all? Or Walter Cronkite would say, and everything's the same except for You Were There. Yeah, I think I do. So we're going through time. Everything's the same except for now you're there. Oh, okay. What's the next article? When was it published and where? I think these are all from York Papers because I I Mm. clipped them. I'm the one who clipped them. Yes. These are from York Papers. Okay, this one goes back all the way to 1874 to the Pigeon Hills. The Pigeon Hills? (laughs) Why, if only we knew someone from the Pigeon Hills. I don't know anyone who would be interested in stories from the Pigeon Hills, Chad. (laughs) That's where his kin are from. This is just entitled A Ghost Story from 27th of February, 1874 from the York Democratic Press. Considerable excitement has been occasioned in the Pigeon Hills about three miles from this place by the report of the appearance of a veritable ghost on a farm in that neighborhood. It seems that the owner of the place referred to died recently, since which event the widow and children have resided there while a hired man slept in an upper room. On Thursday night last week, the widow was awakened by a strange noise outside, the watchdog at the same time howling fearfully. Alarmed, she called the hired man, 
when suddenly she heard a noise upstairs on the, on the opposite side of the house from the hired man's room, a noise as of someone walking heavily. She again called, asking the man what he was doing on that side of the house, and the hired man arose and prepared to descend when the door of his room opened, and in walked the dead man, with arms extending upwards. Without waiting for a parley, the hired man ran down the stairway and reported the horrible sight to the widow. The object Whatever it was had now disappeared, however, and they were no further molested. Since the above was in type, we learned that the ghost passed through the hired man's room twice, the second time approaching his bed, and this advance of his ghost ship was endured quietly until he was within about two feet of the bed, when the hired man gave a scream and the object disappeared. The house has been abandoned at night, no person willing to sleep in it. We hope some bold adventurer will investigate the matter and clear up the mystery if possible." And that comes from the Hanover Herald. Pigeon Hills being nicely sequestered in between York Hanover and, and York. <laughs> and I know Chad's going to ask me, where is that? That's all the information that's in the article, Chad. I wish I knew. wish I knew which house it was. I love the idea that they're doing a call out to paranormal investigators. <laughs> a bold adventurer. I would have done so. I would have been that bold adventurer. All right, next we're going to go to Trent S., who shares the story with us. True scary story from the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. About eight years ago, my wife and I lived in a really old historic building full of apartments in Virginia. It was the old music conservatory in Dayton, Virginia. This building had a plaque out front with pictures of the first people to study there many years ago. The first time I knew the place was weird was when my seven-year-old son looked at the plaque one day and said, I've seen these people. Sometimes they stop by our apartment. Oh, Ooh, yeah. <laughs> oh that just gave me total chills because I, had, I, I hadn't read any of these stories ahead of time, so they're new to me, too. They were all too old to still have been alive. An older gentleman had died in the apartment below ours a few years before we moved in. He was not found until the smell could no longer be ignored. Ooh. My wife and I had this crazy game of trying to scare each other, and one day she got me good. She snuck into the bathroom while I was taking a shower and pulled the curtain back and screamed. She scared the hell out of me. A few months later, I'm home alone and hop into the shower. I'm washing my hair so I have my eyes shut. I hear the front door open and close real softly, footsteps over to the bathroom door, and the faint sound of someone sneaking into the bathroom. I pretend I don't hear it because I'm going to scare her first this time. The soft footsteps walk up to the shower curtain, so I rinse my hair fast and open my eyes. I slowly grab the shower curtain and with crazy speed yank it open and scream at the same time, trying to scare my wife, who I thought was trying to scare me. No one was there. At the exact moment I screamed, the three light bulbs above the bathroom sink that lit the bathroom blew, leaving me alone, naked, and wet in the pitch dark. I immediately panicked. I grabbed a pair of boxers that were on the sink, <laughs> flung the bathroom door open, and ran through the house. Out onto the shared porch, still wet and soapy in my boxers, I waited for someone to come back and go in with me <laughs> before I went back into the apartment. I still have trouble closing my eyes for that brief moment when I'm rinsing my hair in the shower. Oh, those are great creepy stories. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I would have several pairs of emergency underwear <laughs> just, <laughs> just like all around the house in case that would be uh, necessary. And if I saw a ghost, it probably would be. <laughs> We're going back in time again? Yeah, we're going back in time. We're going back even further. This is just post the Civil War. This is 1867. Also from the York Democratic Press. And this is borrowed from a story from the Monongahela Republican. So it's still Pennsylvania. It's just it's not York. Pennsylvania. Not very long ago, the young and beautiful wife of one of our citizens was called to her final account, leaving her husband disconsolate, sad, and bereft. She was buried in the adjacent cemetery, and the husband returned to his desolate home, but not to forget the loved one. She was present with him by day in spirit and in his dreams at night. One peculiarity of his dreams, and one that haunted him, being repeated night after night, was this, that the spirit of his wife came to his bedside and told him that the undertaker had not removed from her face the square piece of muslin which had been used to cover her face after death, 
had screwed down her coffin lid with it upon her, that she could not breathe in her grave, but was unrest on account of the napkin. He tried to drive the dream away, but it bided with him by night and troubled him by day. He sought the consolations of religion. His pastor prayed with him and assured him that it was wicked to indulge such morbid fantasy. It was the subject of his own petition before the throne of grace, but still the spirit came and told anew the story of her suffocation. In despair, he sought the undertaker, Mr. Dickey, who told him that the napkin had not been removed, but urged him to forget the circumstance, as it could not be any possible annoyance to an inanimate clay. And while the gentleman frankly acknowledged this, he could not avoid the apparition, and continual stress upon his mind began to tell upon his health. At length he determined to have the body disinterred and visited the undertaker for that purpose. Here he was met with the same advice and persuasion, and convinced once more of his folly, the haunted man returned to his home. That night, more vivid than ever, more terribly real than before, she came to his bedside and upbraided him for what, for his want of affection, and would not leave him until he promised to remove the cause of all of her suffering. The next night, with a friend, he repaired to the sexton, who was prevailed upon to accompany them, and thereby the light of the cold, round the moon, the body was moved from its narrow bed, the coffin lid unscrewed, and the napkin removed from the face of the corpse. That night she came to his bedside once more, but for the last time. Thanking him for his kindness, she pressed her cold lips to his cheek, and it came again no more. Reader, this is a true story. Can you explain the mysteries of dreams? I no. like that one. Yeah, I like that one too. Back to Modern Times. This is from Natasha T. She says, I have to reach out about just a rather strange incident that occurred recently. I was in between appointments for work, working out of a coffee shop. I'm sitting in the front window on my laptop, looking out towards the parking lot. I see a flash of white and look up. A regular old white Honda flies into a parking spot, and a very sweaty, harassed-looking gentleman rushes into the coffee shop. This man was very nondescript. I still cannot think of a single detail about him, except that he had lost his hair on top of his head. That's all. I couldn't even tell you what he was wearing. He rushes into the shop and comes full tilt and boogies towards me. He gestures towards my vehicle and says, I've been looking everywhere for you. This is you, right? Bewildered by an older man asking me such personal questions in such a frantic way, I don't think I answered. I just looked at him. He pulls out his phone and shows me he's been listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. I admit I haven't listened. He asked me, have you listened to this one? It's very important. It was episode 844 for reference, as I know you've made reference to this episode in a recent episode of Strange Familiars. At this point, all I can ask is, excuse me? He pulls up a chair and leans into me. He tells me that he loves my beating. He needs me to make something to help out him and his wife, that they are experiencing problems at home that only an aboriginal person can fix. At this point, I'm looking around at everybody else. If an older strange man who appears to be this animated and aggressive for my attention, surely they'd notice. Maybe he's a regular patron of this cafe, and this is just his M.O. Nobody looked up. I tried making eye contact as in SOS, but nobody would look at me. He locks eyes with me and says, my wife needs the Eagle Woman. She's had dreams about you. As you may know, my Haida name is Shining Heart Eagle Woman. She makes beads, I think, under Eagle Woman beads as well. Oh, okay. I give him a business card silently, as I cannot speak at this point. He takes it, thanks me. He offers to take me to my car, which I respond no. He leaves the building. Again, I look around for an SOS and nothing. I look back at him and he's gone. Car is gone. Everything. This was only maybe three seconds. When I think back on it, I do have a very small sticker that says, At Eagle Woman Beads, but it's very tiny and would not be visible to be seen from the road. For reference, we live by Vancouver, very busy, lots of people. I cannot explain this man's actions or how he was already in tune to my personal interest. Very odd indeed. It is odd for him to just come in and say, like, like he just found her, you know? That, to me, seems like someone who's been looking for someone. Yeah, that would worry me, right? Yeah, that would be very worrying to me. Yeah. Maybe he was following her on on Instagram or something, and then following her in real life, you know? Yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah. 
I hope it was just because he felt like he needed some relief and not because of anything creepy. Anything creepy. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully it's all good. Thank you for your story, Natasha. Hope all is well. All right, are we going back in time again? Yeah. I'm going to start reading you a shoe fly pie recipe. <laughs> <laughs> We're going back even further. Okay. We're going back to 1850. 1850? That's before I was born. Yeah, it was just a stretch. This is from the People's Advocate, York, Pennsylvania, the 5th of March, 1850. Mysterious Chimney. Many are the mysteries of this world. Indeed, there is scarcely an old building, dwelling house, or barn that has not some ghost story or other mystery connected with it. The mysterious knocking at Rochester, we confess, is a great affair of humbug. So they're talking about the Fox sisters. Oh, that early? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. But it cannot be compared to the mysterious chimney of which we intend to say something. I kind of feel like the Fox sisters might have... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the, the birth of spiritualism versus a I chimney. Read this. This okay. is a pretty cool chimney. Okay. This chimney is not in some secluded and desolate country, but in York, not a hundred miles from the corner of Beaver Street and the railroad. <laughs> the first discovery that the present occupant of the house made was by means of a sweep, whom he had employed to clean the chimney. It appears that he ascended a considerable distance when on a sudden he found his path obstructed by numerous pieces of stovepipe, which were drawn into the chimney. These pipes were taken piece by piece from the stove at different times, and no one could imagine where they had gone to until they were found as above stated. Since the discovery of the pipes, nothing is safe in the room. We are informed by the occupant himself that large pieces of coal are drawn up into the pipe and into the chimney, and that it is necessary to chain the coal down in order to keep them in the stove. Chairs from the extreme end of the room will walk towards the mouth of the stove, like if they were desirous of warming their shins, and in fact every piece of furniture is moved by the wonderful attracting power of the chimney. Even the carpet, which had been nailed down unusually fast, was torn up, nails and all, by the mysterious power. And it had not been for the tremendous exertions of the owner, they would have all been drawn up the chimney. The children are often in the greatest danger, as the power is so great that even they are drawn towards the stove. Cats are no circumstance when they venture into the room, as their struggles are but short before they are sailing through the pipe and into the chimney. Now talk about your witches and your Rochester mysteries, why they are no circumstance to the mysterious chimney. Just imagine cats, wood, and tons of coal flying up the stovepipe into the chimney, chairs promenading around the room, carpets raising themselves up from the floor and hurrying towards the stove, and even a strong, hale man lying on his back, struggling with all his might to pull his foot out of the stove, which he has accidentally exposed to the draft. Just think of it. I'm thinking. That's a pretty cool story, though. I'm trying to figure out where this is. Everything, not 100 miles from Beaver. Why would it say not 100 miles? I guess that's just an old-timey way of saying it was close. The corner of Beaver Street and the railroad. That would be where the um, National House is, kind of. Okay. I mean, there's a block in between. Well, no, that is Beaver. It's kind of close to the old post office. Hmm. I'm just wondering if there isn't any house there because everything gets sucked into it and says no longer. <laughs> it's just a black hole. It's just a black hole. Just a chimney. I just thought that was York generally. <laughs> Back to the Future, from Sonia C. Hello, Tim. Thank you for hosting such an amazing podcast. Did huh. you add that in there? No, that's, that's, oh, really that's actually in there. written there. Yeah, okay. yeah. These are the things that get me through my day and keep me interested in the human experience. That being said, I have just a couple experiences to share. Did I add that? <laughs> my teenager years were coming to an end. I was 18 years old in 2001. Not doing much. Not partying or going out as I had the overprotective type of parent. We had some bad turmoil my last year with my dad and my stepmom. I lived in an upstairs room across from my parents. I had a TV and a bathroom in my room. 
I do remember sometimes my TV would turn on and off, but I never thought anything of it. I am the person with the very odd dreams, and I used to write them down until I heard that you would only dream more, and they had gotten so weird that I stopped writing. It was my last year in high school, and I worked at the Halloween store on the weekends and was always into the spooky aspects of life, scary movies, dark music, etc., which did not help when the most terrifying and bizarre incident happened to me. I remember shortly before this day, I had a dream that my room had turned into bathroom stalls. I believe the doors of the stalls were orange, and a man hid in there. He looked like Pinhead without the pins. It was very Stanley Kubrick-esque. I ran to my parents' room in my dream and woke them. I told them a terrifying person was waiting for me, and they of course told me to go back to sleep and did nothing. That was the whole dream. Not long after, I went to bed on a school night, I believe. I had a strict 9 p.m. bedtime, which did not fit my insomnia. I always tried to fall asleep, though, when TV was uninteresting, where I did not want to be caught with it on. I had a metal futon bunk bed. Top bunk was for my cat, Kitty, (laughs) since my friends weren't over much. My other cat, George, slept with me on the bottom bunk. I was tossing and turning, wondering when I would fall asleep. I watched my clock turn over hours on a digital clock by my window. 12 a.m., 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m., Around this time, I remember looking towards my door. My cats were not visible or making any noise, which I didn't think was noteworthy until after this night. My cat George would scratch on the door to go on night walks or demand sink water by knocking stuff down off the counter. I had a bathroom in my room. Not a peep. I went from looking at my door, thinking the nook next to it looked darker than normal, something I also noted after. I turned over now to face my window. I had just shut my eyes, and then from under my covers, from the, from the side of the bed facing the door, a sort of tube of air slid under me. I was then paralyzed with pure fear. I lifted maybe an inch with this tube of air, which felt like a pool noodle floating under me. There was a voice in my pillow. It was very deep and sounded like it was either speaking backwards or in tongues, Mirschmar, Morschmir, which looked silly typed, but put it on a baritone or deeper voice. It was horrific. That's not a pure quote, as I could not understand the words at all. And then after it spoke, it rolled out from under me and off the bed. Pure fear. I then came out of my fear when I saw one of my cats shortly after. That's why I noted I don't recall seeing them before this. I couldn't say if it was between sleep and being awake, as I felt wide awake the whole time. I do not remember if I got to sleep that morning or just stayed awake until it was light out. I told no one in the house, but told some people at the job, which was at the Halloween store. I knew they would think I was making things up or brush it off because I was the goth girl working at a Halloween store. I just needed to get it off my chest. Shortly after, I had a big fight with my parents and was kicked out. I actually felt some relief because I knew I didn't have to sleep in that room anymore. Fast forward to a time at about the age of 22. I had sleep paralysis while living with a boyfriend and roommates. I was trying to sleep while my party roommates and boyfriend were in the living room. It must have been 2 a.m., and I needed to sleep to go to work. I was then frozen and heard out of the apartment window of my bedroom the sound of a school bus of children being dropped off. So many children's voices, like laughing and talking. But it was 2 a.m. I couldn't move, and I called to my boyfriend, and then I could move and immediately went to the living room and told everyone there what happened. I never looked out the window. Maybe it was, in fact, children, but I was frozen while it happened, and that's the weird part. I know you hear people falling asleep after sleep paralysis, but it seems my adrenaline just pumps me back awake, and also I generally have a hard time falling asleep anyway. Now, this is the time of 2015. I live in a converted hotel above the bar I worked at. It was a 100-year-old building with lots of history. An odd apartment set up as me and my son's dad, I was pregnant at the time, shared a bathroom with everyone who lived in the rooms. I don't actually recall any paranormal encounters here, but it would be the perfect setting, one would think. I only can tell you that I woke up one morning extremely groggy, groggier than normal, and I went to the bathroom and there was a large mirror. I noticed an almost perfectly square gridded pattern bruise on my bum. I was so weirded out by its pattern I had to take a picture. I shared it with my brother, who was a nurse. I purposefully only took a photo of the pattern for this reason, not wanting to share a photo of my butt with my brother. What is this, I asked. He answered back, with maybe a skin condition from our shared bathroom, which did not match the photos of every terrible thing you could get from a dirty bathroom. (laughs) Plus, I hated a shared bathroom and always brought an arsenal of cleaning products. 
No photo online matched up, except on one site at the time about experimental dreaming. If I can remember the site name, I'll email it to you. I don't have the site saved. I remember the site stating that if you've experienced the grid phenomenon, please email. I did, but heard nothing back from the site, and it has not been touched since. I remember them stating that this was happening all around the same time, and the years went from about 2015 to 2017. Keep checking in online searches to see if I can find a medical explanation, but I only end up back to the first site or on UFO sites. These are my most memorable stories. I love your podcast because you take such care with everyone's experiences, so thank you. Thank you for giving us something to look forward to. Thank oh, you, Sonia. That person wrote to me. Oh, really? Oh, is that the... <laughs> yeah. So you saw the photo. Yeah, I saw the photo uh, because I um, I remember her saying that she was unsure whether she wanted to st- share the story or not. And I was like, just go for it. Like, oh, that's right. Yeah. So you actually saw the photo. Yeah. What did it look like? It looked like a grid on somebody's butt. Skin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you didn't see the butt. but Yeah, it was just, it just the, looked like I couldn't tell where it Hmm, now I'm wondering if I've ever woken up with a grid. Yeah, maybe it disappeared before you even saw it. Yeah, I don't know. I know I've got bruises all the time. You're like, where'd you, where was that bruise? What'd you do to yourself? I'm like, I don't know. No clue. I don't know if that's MS or just thinking about 10 other things or both. I don't know. Sort of an oblivious male thing, maybe? <laughs> yeah, it could be. Yeah. Probably hiking. That's, okay. Where'd you get that bruise? Probably hiking. All right. Any more back in time stories? Uh, okay. Let's see. Yes, we do. We have two more. Okay. I think one of them is very, very short, if I remember correctly. Yes, that's the one we're going to read now. That's from York, New Salem, which is not that far away from the Pigeon Hills. It's not. I put that in there just because I know York, New Salem is one of the places you visit frequently. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is also from the York Democratic Press. There's considerable talk about ghosts in this neighborhood. A house not far from here is said to be haunted, and at other places the ghosts are said to walk the streets. For my part, I don't believe in ghosts or ghost stories. That's the entirety of the I article. like the idea of ghosts walking the streets of York, New Salem, though. They could still be doing that. Tell you what, I drive through there on the way back from Chad's every time. Mm-hmm. Not seen a ghost yet, but I'll be on the lookout for him. Mm-hmm. Good idea. Give us the last one from back in time. Okay. This is the East King Street ghost story. And this is from 1902, fairly recently. (laughs) What paper? This is from the York Daily. Pursuant to rumors circulated and published as to mysterious doings of the supernatural in an East King Street home, a daily representative last night started out to investigate. The scene of action was finally located in the home of Peter Kipp at 546 East King Street, and after considerable delay and perseverance, admission was gained to the house. There existed an evident condition of nervous excitement on the part of some of the inmates owing to recent events there. Mr. Kipp had been absent from the city on business for two weeks, and the doings had been in progress during the past week. He and his wife are spoken of as among the most esteemable persons of this section. At the reporter's request to visit the front room, he was escorted by three members of the family and courteously shown the positions in which most of the contents of the room have been found on five occasions— being on as many different days of those last weeks. Chairs were overturned, glass and other bric-a-brac from mantle and table were scattered over the floor, and other articles had joined in the general war dance. Hours for their occurrence were stated to have been between morning and noon of the five eventful days. On Saturday, Mr. Fry, who owns the house, visited the place, replaced the scattered articles, did some plain, sensible talking concerning such doings, and since that day nothing startling has occurred. Mrs. Kipp, owing to the effect on her nervous system, has an aversion to visiting the room. A son-in-law, Jacob Dellinger, said he had entered the room each of the five mornings, seeing that all was right, and on his returning at noon found the general mix-up. The work has evidently been done by some person having an object in view. This object, judging from a coincidence of conditions, is not unlikely to be the causing of Mr. and Mrs. Kipp to leave the property by working upon the nerves of Mrs. Kipp during the absence of her husband. I'm going to look this up because I need, now I need to know where this house is. <laughs> Very rarely do they give the person's name and the exact location. Being that this is York and huge swaths of it have been cut down 
usually the coolest parts. <laughs> I'm imagining that this house probably does not exist anymore. 46 East King Street is now, yeah, it's an industrial area, the house is gone. This is from Joe Kay, who sent this in 2018, and I'm not sure if I re ever read it on the podcast. As you have said many times before, it doesn't expire. Yes, there's no expiration date. Joe says, when I was 17 or 18, 1999 or so, I saw a flannel man. My bedroom was in the basement, and my room had no windows, so it was totally dark. I remember my father had fallen asleep on the basement couch watching TV. It was roughly 10 or 11 p.m., I had just dozed off to sleep when my eyes suddenly caught something standing directly in my line of sight about four or five feet away. I remember it was totally dark inside the bedroom. It was a bright red flannel shirt and a bearded man. It just stood there. It was so real to me that I shouted and threw my pillow at it. I was shaking. I immediately got out of the room and slept on the floor next to my dad because it was so disturbing. For years I chalked it up to a case of sleep paralysis, and maybe it still is. I didn't tell anyone about the experience for years. About 10 years later, I told my mom about it, and she asked me if I was joking. She got very serious. When I was very young, we lived in a different house. She said that on two separate occasions, she thought a man in a red flannel shirt was in our house, standing in our long hallway. She was freaked out by it. That's the first time I thought maybe my sighting wasn't sleep paralysis, and maybe there's something more to it. Then when I saw your podcast on the subject, it kind of blew my mind. Another flannel man added to the canon. Classic. 90s. Do you have um, flannel man... Um, do you have different flaps of flannel man? As uh, you, do for you know, I have to say that the 90s are pretty heavy with flannel man. And Sarias blames grunge. <laughs> you, I don't... You know, maybe it was something in the air. But, you know, of course, they occurred long before that. Yeah. And they still occur, uh -huh. but there was a big, thick, you know, mass of sightings right in the 90s. So I don't know, grunting it out. Well, I guess the question is, did Flannel Man bring grunge or did grunge bring Flannel Man? What came first? Mm -hmm. Before we get to our curiosity of the week, I just want to thank Ando B for his PayPal donation. Thank you so much. That's another way you can help out. You can make a one-time donation via PayPal. Go to the show notes for any episode at strangefamiliars.com, and you'll find a PayPal link there. I also want to mention one of our longtime listeners. He's a patron. He's got quite a few medical bills. He's been going through it. Maynard Wall. He has a GoFundMe. We'll put the link for that in the show notes. If you can help him out, please do. Maynard, feel better soon, buddy. Our Thanksgiving curiosity. It's a kind of ghostly image. It is. There. Sometimes when I find pictures, I was, besides the fact that all the people now probably are ghosts, <laughs> that she really looks like a ghost to me. And I was going to keep her for myself, but then I spent way too much money. Mm. And now... Now she gets to be someone else's she ghost. Gets to be someone else. This is a cased image. Have we done any cased images? If we have, it's been a while. Yeah. I forget how awesome they, you know, because I mean, there's so many around here. I see them so often, these cased images. Mm -hmm. You forget how awesome these little, like, frames are and the little mats. Yeah, every part of it is just very aesthetically pleasing, I think. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's really, really cool. They're, I mean, well, they're based on little portrait miniatures. Like, you know, they were housed in similar cases, and so... It's a very special little personal thing to have. Mm -hmm. So this is what type of photograph, Alice? This is a ninth plate amber type. Now, how did they make amber types? They are on glass as opposed to daguerreotypes, which are on silver-coated copper. And these are the ones they have to have something dark behind them, right? So they'll show up, amber types? Generally speaking, yes. Generally speaking. There are exceptions. 
Well, there's different ways that they were done. Either they were on a clear pane of glass and they have to have something black behind it, or there's like a black lacquer behind it, or they're on like a ruby colored glass or... Gotcha. Yeah. No. But she has some interesting... Um, I know there are people that collect just um, distortions and patinas and such, and this one has a really cool uh, kind of bluish cast to it, and she's in an, an outfit that reads all black, and so she, and it's just very sort of perfectly composed. She has her hands just clasped below her, but she mainly just looks sort of like a blank, like she's in a black shroud almost, but not over her head. What year would you guess? Um, 1850s to maybe very early 1860s. So you can actually own an image from the 1850s, a photograph. That's so cool, right? I mean, like, I know that's the amazing thing about yeah. photographs. It's like, there's not many, I mean, I have some books for sale right now that are from the 1700s, but how often do you get to just hold something that old? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, this is the last that anybody will remember this person. I think that's why I, I always want to save every photograph because you know you talk about the two deaths one when you die and one when you're forgotten yeah and you know them you well know. that's why you spend so much time trying to find out about each person yeah if, if yeah you can. I if there's any indication that you can find something out i know you spend time trying to find out who they are yeah and this little girl i have no idea who she is there's nothing in the case mm. about her that's just a little half case but it, it, it would sit perfectly you know just by your computer as you work during the day. <laughs> All right. I'll put an image of this in the show notes at strangefamiliars.com. If you click on that, it'll take you to our Etsy shop where you can purchase this and other curiosities of the week, such that are left. And since it is a time when people tend to be buying little gifts for friends, I'd also like to mention Riverbend Comics. Riverbend Comics. Riverbendcomics.com. You can get my... Mothman cover there for the Department of Truth that's 50% off. All versions of it are 50% off, I think. So the one with the card, the one with the um, comic by itself, and the signed version. I think they're all 50% off. They're at riverbendcomics.com. Plus you can get a ton of different trade paperbacks and comics if you want to just shop with like a small local company as opposed to big stores. I think that would be a great place if you're thinking of buying stuff like that for friends. John can get... Anything new, he can do subscriptions for you. If you buy comics regularly, he can do your subscriptions and, you know, say, you know, I want Batman, Amazing Spider-Man, and Department of Truth. We'll make sure to you get every issue of that and so forth. So check out riverbendcomics.com. Check out our Etsy shop. Our shop name is Lost Grave. If you type in Strange Familiars, our stuff should come up. It will come up. <laughs> and... You can get my books there. All of them are available on Etsy. You can get Strange Familiar's t-shirts there, Glow in the Dark or Regular of the Awoken Tree design. You can get Strange Familiar's patches and stickers. You can get artwork there. I have originals and prints there. You have a good selection of photographs there, antique photographs. And some other stuff, some other curiosities of the week. And even going back to when we used to do the photo of the week, we've got some of the photos of the week there. So check it out. Again, shop name is Lost Grave. It all goes into one bin. So if you help us out by buying on Etsy, you're helping out the show, helping us make more strange familiars. And as the holidays are coming, it's a good time to get your orders in. I uh, just want to remind everybody about The Flowered Path, the fourth episode dropped this week i'm probably going to go to every other week from this point on or it might even be whenever they're done so it'll be a, a less frequent schedule but the fourth episode is out you can check it out at the flowered path or wherever you listen to podcasts and it would help me a lot if you subscribe to that wherever you listen whether it's on youtube or stitcher or apple podcasts or amazon music wherever it is even if you don't want to listen, just go ahead and subscribe anyway. You can always just delete them, but it helps helps me out. That's what I did. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back soon with more Strange Familiars. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts. 
music books, art, podcasts, and more. Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. If you want to hear more or purchase music by Stone Breath, you can go to stonebreath.bandcamp.com. Strange Familiars is on Facebook, facebook.com slash strangefamiliars. It is there that you can join the Strange Familiars Gathering Group, where we talk about all kinds of fun and spooky things. <laughs> We're on Instagram, at strangefamiliars, one word. Go ahead and follow us there. And if you're wandering around the web looking for us, we're at strangefamiliars.com.
Walking sand. 